Okay, so a bit of Christmas cheer. It's Greg Aloff at AFAC. Welcome to those of you that are online. Um, you will all be muted and there's a message there if you've dialled in onto the computer you um, can use the chat box for any messages that you need. Now, Mike Wouters, are you online? I don't think Mike is online at the moment. So I'm, I think I'll open the uh, webinar given I haven't heard from Mike um, and we'll kick off. Jimmy in here. Uh, Simeon, good afternoon, Simeon. So are you going hey, to Mike? chair this? Yeah, Mike's just on his way from a meeting, so he'll should be here fairly soon. And I'm just frantically trying to update um, Flash Player on my computer, so we we logged in soon. Okay. All right. Well, look, I've, uh, given it's um, a couple of minutes past one, I might open it um, on Mike's behalf, if that's all right. Yep, go for it. No, he said to just get started if he was running late, so yeah, yep. sounds good. Okay, welcome everyone to another one of the uh, Predictive Services Bushfires Practitioners Network's uh, webinars. Uh, Mike Wilders has been organising these and doing a great job. And uh, today we've got uh, Kevin Torrey from the Bureau of Meteorology talking about the development of Pyrocumulonimbus prediction tool. So I'd like to welcome you, Kevin, to this afternoon and I'll hand over to you to start the webinar. Thank you. Um, well, I, I should just mention that this work started out of a little bit of blue sky research. Um, I was just trying to, to illustrate some pedantic point, uh, some a pedant, pedantic thermodynamic issue, and it just grew and grew and grew into this, um, uh, this, this, this quite promising tool. Um, so, and also, uh, I'm just I'm not used to talking to nobody. I'm not used to um, and not having the audience see me wave my hands around. So my hand waving is going to be purely with this red dot that you can see, hopefully you can see on the screen. Um, so the, this pyrocumulonimbus prediction tool now has a name. It's the PyroCB firepower threshold. So the PyroCB is obvious, um, but what is firepower? So firepower is the rate at which heat enters the plume. Um, so it's like a heat flux into the plume. And why a threshold? And the reason why we, we need to consider a threshold is because we actually know nothing about the fire. All we have is information about uh, the thermodynamic environment. So what we're looking for is what is the minimum firepower required in a particular thermodynamic environment that would support the formation of PyroCB. Um, so the, the tool itself it looks a bit like this when we, we plot it out on a spatial map of um, this, this PFT, as we're, we're calling it. Um, so up there is an example from the Sir Ivan fire. And I don't know if you can make out the numbers on the side, but the units are gigawatts. So that's that's the amount of heat required from a fire in this particular environment uh, for pyrocb formation. And so the smaller the number, the lower the threshold, so the more favourable the conditions are. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll show a bit more detail about this later in the presentation. But just um, to keep everyone interested, here's a photo of the, um, of the pyrocb at about the time of that analysis above. So next, I'm going to go a little bit into the, uh, give a little bit of background, background into plume structure and behaviour. And apologies for the American spelling there. Um, clearly, the spell checker provided by BNHCRC <laughs> uh, it wasn't switched to Australian. Um, and then I'll, I'll introduce the Briggs plume models. It's a really simple um, mathematical uh, model of fire plumes, and it's. I think it's, it's surprisingly effective, even even though it is it's highly simplistic. After that, I'll show how we identify these uh, the PyroCB firepower threshold ingredients from a thermodynamic diagram, and then I'll, I'll give some sample results just to illustrate um, where um, 
we're, we're going with this product. So a bit of background. We all know that buoyant plumes entrain air from the environment. So here we have a beautiful image of smoke rising from a candle plume. Um, now, at the bottom left corner we have laminar flow, and you can see that as the smoke rises, it's like a, a surface of the smoke, and it, it starts to curve around and wrap on itself. And that's because air is from the environment is starting to be wrapped into the back of the plume. And here we have the formation of a ring vortex. Now that ring vortex um, is also wrapping environment air into the plume. If we go up a bit further, we can see a more mature ring vortex. And you can also see this sort of central um, region that's actually containing some environment air. And as we rise, it starts to break down a bit and become more turbulent. So all of this air that's being entrained into the plume is, as it becomes turbulent, it starts to mix and mix and mix. So you, you end up with a much more dilute plume um, as, we, as, as it rises. Um, so this entrainment, which is diluting the plume, it's, it's bringing cooler air in from the environment. So it's reducing its buoyancy. Um, and the initial buoyancy is obviously proportional to the firepower. We have a much, much hotter fire. We're going to have a lot um, greater buoyancy in the plume. Um, but the, the rate at which the buoyancy is reduced by entrainment determines how rapidly the plume rises and how high it rises. Now these are obvious statements really, but I just want to have it, um, put it out there so it's in the back of everyone's minds because this is really key to understanding whether or not a fire um, is going to or has the ability or the, the potential to produce pyrocb, and particularly how high it rises. Plumes need to rise very high if they're going to um, cool through adiabatic expansion uh, leading to condensation forming within the, the, the plume. So we know that plume buoyancy is influenced by fire size and intensity, that's the firepower, um, but it's also influenced by the background wind. The stronger the wind, the more the plume gets blown over and the more um, entrainment that um, it, it, it encounters. And together these two ingredients largely determine how high the plume rises. Um, so here's an example, here's a campfire. Now clearly the firepower in this case is very small compared to a wildfire. And we can also see from the, the fact that the plume is rising almost vertically that the background wind U is also very low. We might expect in this example that the, uh, the plume will rise a few tens of metres. Now the other extreme, here we have a much larger fire also in the background of light, uh, in background of light wind. We can see that because the, the plume is quite upright. But in this case, the, um, the plumes are rising a, a number of kilometres. And here we have another fire where potentially it, it, this fire could have the same firepower as the previous image, but the wind, the background wind is much stronger, so it's getting blown over and it's entraining much more rapidly because of that. And so it might only be rising a few hundred metres. Basic relationship is quite well described by um, solutions solutions to the Briggs model. Uh, if we have a look at this equation, um, so the Briggs model I've coloured the the components of importance. So let's see is the height of the plume centre line. Now B flux is a buoyancy flux. Just treat that as the firepower. Um, U is the background wind again, and X is the distance downstream. So we can illustrate that it's here we have a fire, here we have our coordinate system, Z is up, X is distance downstream, and then this equation describes a plume centre line like this in blue, which is um, bent over based on the, the, uh, the, the wind, the background wind speed. Now the geometry of the plume is, is really quite simple. It's assumed that if you take a vertical cross-section through the plume, it has circular geometry of radius r, and this radius is linearly proportional to the height of the centre line. So it's, it, as, as the plume rises, the radius grows, and this beta is a constant, and it appears here in the equation. So just to give um, 
bit of an insight into the sensitivity of these terms. If, if we were to double the plume height and produce something like this, we could either increase the firepower by eight times, so a, a much, much bigger fire, or we could halve the wind speed. Now, to me, this is a, a really insightful result and one that I, um, I was quite surprised to see. Because if you think, think about it, if you see a, the plume changing structure from being highly bent over to standing up or, or, or vice versa, often um, we hear um, descriptions of, oh, well, there must have been a change in, in the fuel type or a change in, uh, which, which affected the amount of heat um, going into the fire. But equally, and perhaps more likely, there could have been just a temporal change in the wind speed because we can see it um, from this equation at least, the, the height of the plume or the, how steep the plume is is much more sensitive to the wind speed than it is to the, the firepower. Um, oh, that's interesting. Okay, so something's changed with the animation here, but anyway, that's, that's fine. Um, so how do we use the Briggs model? Um, so we, 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 what we do is we put, oh, how it illustrate is I'll add an, an image of a pyro, this is a, a, a little um, window from a, an image of a pyro CB, um, and in this case the, the height at which the condensation is occurring or the cloud is, is here, marked by this yellow line. And just for now we'll call this the free convection height. So this is the height that um, in theory, if the plume makes it to this height, it will then freely convect, um, leading to the development of pyro CB. Now you notice that only some upper fraction of the plume, which I'll call alpha, um, is, is needed to reach this particular height. Um, and the other thing is that nearly every environment uh, that we're pyro CB form, we have, um, uh, generally we have a well mixed layer, and above it, a stable layer. Now, if the plume is going to um, uh, penetrate the stable layer, it needs some minim minimum buoyancy to be able to punch through. We call this the free convection buoyancy, the BFC here. Um, so, now, we, th there happens to be an equation that describes the, uh, the buoyancy along the plume center line here. We can invert that equation to, to um, work out the firepower. And it looks like this. Um, so the, the, the PFT is this complex mix of um, variables. But fortunately, they're constant, so we can ignore them for now. And then we can see this very simple relationship between these th three variables, the free convection height, the um, background wind speed, and the free convection buoyancy. Now, does this equation pass the pub, pub test? This is where these lines were suddenly meant to appear as I click some buttons, but they're here early. So the free convection height, the larger the free convection height, the higher the plume must rise, so the more firepower required. So that, that one's fairly logical. The stronger the background wind, the more firepower is required to counter the plume's tendency to bend over. So if we had a, if you imagine this image here, if the wind um, uh, decreased or um, the, the, then you, the plume would stand up or if the fire, so if we had a, a, a stronger wind then we'd need a much stronger fire for the plume to reach this um, free convection height. And again with the, the, uh, the last term, if the larger the capping inversion, uh, the larger the stable layer above the mixed layer, the hotter the plume must be for it to be able to penetrate that mixed layer, so the, the higher the firepower must be. So this equation, um, I think, to me at least, pass, passes the, the, the pub test. So now I'm going to talk about the pyrocumulus thermodynamic model. So this, this is, I mentioned at the beginning, we did some um, blue, blue sky researchers playing around with some equations. And uh, that led to this particular model that I'm about to introduce, which um, was published earlier this year. So the model is used to determine the saturation point on a thermodynamic diagram of any hypothetical plume element. Now, that probably doesn't mean much to anyone until I uh, start illustrating it. 
So what I have here is, is a schematic diagram of a fire with a plume and these little circles that are um, following the arrows are the pathways of hypothetical plume elements. Um, so this central one here is plume element one. Now we, we assume that the, the, the uh, at this point it's pure combustion gas. But as it rises, we know it's in training air for the environment, so it's um, becoming more dilute and it's uh, expanding um, and, it, and then more dilute and it continues to expand and cool. Now it's expanding and cooling for two reasons. One, it's in training in environment air, so the volume is increasing because there's just more mass. And the other reason is that as the plume rises into lower atmospheric pressure, there's this adiabatic expansion. Both processes lead to a cooling, and if it cools enough, it, the parcel condenses. And in this case, we say it's got enough buoyancy to start freely convecting, and it's about to accelerate up the top through the top of the image. Um, plume element two over here um, is we so it's closer to the edge. It's training more rapidly, so it loses buoyancy more rapidly, becomes more dilute more rapidly, and it just reaches the height where it condenses, but it doesn't have enough um, buoyancy to to break, break through the, the stable layer. And then this element over here, it's very close to the edge. It entrains at a much higher rate, and it actually becomes neutrally buoyant before it has a chance to condense. So. Why did I take you through all this? Because this is just three possible pathways of uh, you know, an infinite number of potential parcels within this plume. And what we need, want to do is be able to identify where it, every one of these plume parcels will saturate on a thermodynamic diagram. And we can find that um, if we make three basic assumptions, which I think they're actually quite reasonable. The first assumption is that all of the radiative heat loss occurs in the flaming zone prior to the parcels beginning to, to become dilute by entraining environment air. Second one is that we assume that the fire produces a constant ratio of heat to moisture. And the third one is that the environment it's, in, it's occurring in a mixed layer environment where the environment potential temperature is constant and the environment um, uh, moisture is constant. We can see this on this particular thermodynamic diagram. Now, if, if everyone's screwing up their, their faces and saying, well, well, hang on, this doesn't look like a thermo thermodynamic diagram, it's because it's very, very atypical. I've stretched the scale so it goes all the way out to the flame temperature. Um, but um, what, what I'll do is I'll take you through it here. So just like any thermodynamic diagram, we've got pressure decreasing um, as we go up the y-axis. We've got temperature increasing. Now these, this dashed line here is a line of constant temperature. That's 500 Kelvin. We've got 600 Kelvin over here, 400 there, and 300 here. So what we're used to seeing is, is you know, a patch about here. Now in black down there, this is the environment this is a, a, a hypothetical mixed layer potential temperature, that line here, and this is the mixed layer specific humid, humidity. And that makes up the, the inverted B of a, a classic um, pyro, pyro CB environment. I haven't included any trace above that um, because it, it, it's irrelevant for this particular exercise. So, um, yeah, so the, one of the assumptions was that we had a constant potential temperature and constant um, specific humidity in the, in the mixed layer, which is here. Now let's go back to parcel one. It's emitted um, from the flame zone at 600 Kelvin. It rises following this yellow line along the bottom here. Um, so it's, it's, it's becoming dilute very, very rapidly as it, and as, as a consequence, uh, temperature is dropping, and then it follows all this, this uh, and it condenses at that point there. So on the thermodynamic diagram, this is that parcel saturation point. So I'll leave a spot here because there's one saturation point. Um, but we could also say, well, that same parcel, what would happen if it didn't become diluted, if it managed to become pure, completely insulated? 
And uh, um, where would its saturation point bring then? It would actually follow this red line up here, and it would saturate at a pressure of 60 hectopascals, which I think is around 25 kilometres above the surface. So we can see that this, this idea that a, a completely undiluted parcel is just massively unrealistic. Um, but the main point is that that's another saturation point. It's another potential saturation point. And we can do the same thing for any position along this line that that parcel took and calculate the saturation point. And you can see we end up with a curve which describes all those points. So you might say, well, what, what about the other, um, the other, other parcels? So here's uh, focusing in on um, parcel two and parcel three. And you can see that they also, you could do, do the same thing, but they, they will also condense on that blue line. Now, the, the interesting thing with parcel two, of course, is that it, because it, it underwent greater um, dilution on the way up, it uh, saturates at a cooler temperature with less buoyancy. In parcel three, we said before that it didn't actually rise high enough. That's because it intersected the um, environment potential temperature line here, which essentially means it had the same temperature or neutral buoyancy. So it lost buoyancy before it had the opportunity to condense. Um, so how do we find the PFT ingredients on the thermodynamic diagram? Well, the very first thing we do is we add that saturation point curve. Because it, it describes the, the position on the thermodynamic diagram at every single um, plume element will condense on if lifted high enough. Um, and what I find really interesting is that if, if you assume that the fire is producing the same heat to moisture ratio, it doesn't matter whether it's the candle flame I showed you earlier on or whether it's the campfire or whether it's any one of those other images of, of the wildfire, um, they will all condense on that line here. And that's a really, really um, useful piece of information. So here's the, the uh, mixed layer potential temperature. Uh, I'll be, sorry, this, this, is, this example is from the Sir Ivan fire. There's the mixed layer specific humidity. And if we took a parcel of this mixed layer air and we raised it, it would condense up here at the mixed layer lifting condensation level, which of course is the, 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 the farthest end of the saturation point curve where we go to the extreme of the plume being 100% dilute. If we raise it further, it would now follow this path here because it's also receiving heat from condensation. But you'll notice it's to the left of the, the environment temperature trace here, which means it's cooler, which means it's negatively buoyant. So this parcel will not rise. It will um, come back down. Um, so, but what we're interested in is what parcel will rise? What parcel will uh, freely convex? The way we find that is we can move along. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention that the reason why that parcel won't rise is because of this stable layer. So we're now looking for a parcel that will be able to punch through that stable layer. So we move along the saturation point curve to the point here and say, well, no, that one won't rise either because it's still to the left of the red um, environment curve. It hasn't penetrated that stable layer. And neither has that one. It's close, but not quite. But then this um, parcel has. It's, it's to the right of the environment trace, so it's buoyant up to a very deep layer. Now, the, the free convection height is this height here, which we can read it off um, the, the, the left scale here. Um, so that's one of the variables we need. Now, a, a hypothetical plume pathway coming from 600 Kelvin way off the edge of the map somewhere might be something like this. So we can work out from that that this um, hypothetical parcel, its potential temperature and specific humidity is given by the dash line there. And it's delta theta warmer than the environment. And if we know how much warmer than the environment this parcel is, we can calculate its buoyancy. It's simply given by gravity multiplied by the delta theta divided by the, um, the mixed layer potential temperature. So now we have two of the ingredients for the PFT. The remaining ingredient is the, um, the, uh, the velocity, 
and we just take the average wind in the mixed layer for this um, for the for, for you, and it, it's essentially that's how we uh, generate at every point um, on a map the PFT, which we can then plot spatially. So here's an example of the PFT for the Sir Ivan fire. Um, this panel here is the PFT itself, and this is the pre-convection height. Here we have the, the background wind speed and the pre-convection buoyancy. This is taken at analysis at 11 a.m. Um, now, I said right at the beginning that the darker the numbers, the darker the colours, the smaller the numbers, so the smaller the, pre the, the, the Pyro CB firepower threshold, the more favourable the environment is for um, Pyro CB to develop. Now, it's off the scale. It basically, it's, it's very extremely unfavourable. And we can look at this and say, well, why is that? And say, OK, well, the free convection height's off the scale. It's more than six kilometres. So the plume would have to get about six, seven kilometres high. Um, and the wind, the wind's up around 20 metres per second. That's a really, really strong wind that's going to blow any plume over. And then if we look at the free convection buoyancy, that area, it's also extremely high. There's, not only is the, does the plume need to get very high, it's got to do it against a really strong wind, and it's got to um, a, a cope with a, a really strong, stable layer above it. But it's, in, in short, it's, it's almost impossible for any fire to generate um, RSCB in this environment. But if we look six hours later, oh, actually, I'll go back. Um, you can see that this favourable region is actually approaching from the southwest. And if we go six hours later, you can see there's a band that's actually passing right over the fire site. Now, if you look at the individual ingredients, the pre-convection height is a little more favourable, but it's still quite high, like four, four and a half kilometres. Um, and the winds are still quite high as well. Um, but the real change is in, is in the pre-convection buoyancy. So right on that change line, the, um, the, there's a, a minimum in the capping inversion. Um, so the first lightning was reported 15 minutes prior to this, um, this analysis, and the fire convection ceased about 30 minutes later. This describes there was only it explains this, um, that there was only a 45 minute period while the pyro CB was active, which roughly coincides with the passage of this band here. Um, and of course, here's that wonderful image of the of the pyro CB in action. Um, so getting, look, look, looking at the two PFT um, plots side by side, so this is 11 a.m. and this is the 5 p.m., we can see other areas with really large values, particularly in, in um, southeast Queensland. And so the obvious question is, are they real or is that a false alarm? Um, and we answer that question by looking at another case, um, the Inglewood fire. Um, in, in this case, the PFT is, is very much smaller than um, than the Sir Ivan. The free convection height is of the order of three and a half kilometres. The wind's only about five metres per second, and the free convection buoyancy is close to zero. I mean, so much so that I had to change the scale of the PFT, and even then, we're in, we're at the very very small value. Um, so essentially, the, the small pre convection buoyancy means it's favourable for, for thunderstorms. And if it's favourable for a thunderstorm, it's also favourable for pyro, for pyro thunderstorms. And um, yeah, so here's, here's the a trace at the fire site. You can see there's the, the mixed layer potential temperature and the mixed layer of specific humidity. And here you can see that the, the moist trace, is, there's zero. Um, uh, you know, the, even if you just lifted the boundary layer of air, it would be unstable. If there's no capping inversion to be um, dealt with. And here's an image of the event. The, the fire is actually, wasn't actually that large compared to the Ivan. Uh, really impressive cloud. It produced quite a bit of lightning. If you ever get a chance to look at the video that um, Mick McCarthy took of this, it's really great to watch. And here, off in the distance, there's another uh, thunderstorm um, sort of confirming that the conditions were right for thunderstorms. 
So getting back to the question of St Ivan's, um, were those regions in the South East Queensland um, an indication of a false alarm or was it a real threat? I'd say it was a real threat. It just, it just, it, it, it's probably there every day. It's just rare that you get really big fires um, when you have conditions favourable for thunderstorms. So I've just thrown in here one more case. Um, I think I don't remember if I mentioned at the beginning that this, this work is really still very young and we've only looked at a handful of cases. Um, this is um, an event from uh, February in 2015. And there were a number of fires burning in southwest WA, um, including the lower Hotham here indicated by the pale blue star and O'Sullivan indicated by the, the purple star. Um, and at this time, you can see there's favourable conditions moving in over Lower Hotham and it hasn't reached O'Sullivan. Um, and a photo um, three hours prior to the analysis time shows the Pyro CB just starting to form in Lower Hotham. We move six hours later. There we go. You can see that the band has moved across um, the fire. And what I'll do is I'll just go back and forth a bit to really highlight the passage of that band across the two fire sites. So at this time, you can see that the, the Lower Hotham fire is now in a region of, of very unfavourable conditions. And if we look at the satellite imagery here, you can see that there is no um, pyro CB, or maybe a tiny bit of cumulus activity here, but certainly no pyro CB. Whereas um, at the O'Sullivan fire, you can see uh, some dead cumulus developing there. And I should also draw your attention to the fires here at Northcliffe that are showing no signs. Now, they may be showing no signs just because uh, we've got this, we're on the edge of this band of favourability, but it might also be that the fire is just not hot enough. Um, so this is an important um, uh, aspect of using this diagnostic. You need to have a sense of how hot the fires are to, to get a sense of um, how, whether a particular environment is going to um, provide dangerous conditions for us. So, um, and here we have an image of the uh, O'Sullivan Pyro CB from the ground. That sort of brings me to the end of the presentation. So, in summary, we mentioned that buoyant plumes, they lose buoyancy as they entrain air from the environment, um, and that the plumes bend over in a cross, cross flow, which is um, well described by the Briggs model. And we use the, the Briggs model um, here to, as a way of tying the environment conditions to plume behaviour. And we end up with an equation for the, the Pyro CB firepower threshold, or the PFT. Um, oh, yeah, there, which, which looks like this. Now, I think this equation itself is really useful. It gives us an idea of the sensitivity of these three basic variables to um, uh, the, 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 the PFT, the, 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 the firepower threshold. Um, and we used the Pyro Q thermodynamic model to determine the PFT ingredient. So that was um, messing around. I showed with the, the thermodynamic diagram to find um, based on saturation point curve to determine the pre-convection height. Pre-convection points is, of course, the, the height at which we calculate the, the, the background wind speed. Um, and finally, we plot spatial maps of the PFT to determine the relative pyro CV threat. And I'll leave it there. Thanks, Kevin. I'll, um, I'll open the lines up for... Uh... The conference is now in conversation mode. All participants are now Unmuted. Make sure your phone's on mute, um, and I'll open it up for questions. And uh, if Mike, if you're there, you feel welcome to chip in at any stage. So, any questions for Kevin? No questions at all on the equations, which blew me away. I've got no idea what they mean. <laughs> it was all Greek to me, Greg. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. I'll hand yeah. over to you to manage. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. That's okay. I was here. I was just a bit late. Um, thanks to Simeon for, for, for surviving. Um, as 
Tory suggested this this uh, is quite insightful work and in its but it's in its early stage so Tory hasn't mentioned it yet but certainly he is interested in other case studies um, both historic and future so one of the reasons I was keen to present this material was to expose the need for people who see PyroQ events to, to communicate with Tory or someone else to, with your local bureau to, to make sure that some of those uh, events get picked up. I know the bureau do look for these things themselves, but uh, it's sometimes it's worth uh, flagging to those people because this certainly needs a few more case, uh, sorry, a few more case studies to, to consolidate the, the approach and, and work out how is it worth pursuing as a as a potential future product. Um, so yeah, that's probably all I had to say. Yeah, and um, so far I've had a fair bit of feedback um, from a number of people uh, with potential events, and I've, I've looked at about probably 10 or 12 events so far, um, but I'm yet to automate the process, so it's extremely inefficient at the moment. Um, so I, I've just got to get my act together and, and um, get a whole lot of other tasks done before I can automate it and then I'll really start um, looking into the, the rest of the events. Um, but I'm always ready to hear from anyone else if they has, have good examples of both um, both when PyroCB was observed and also if you have any examples where PyroCB might have been expected but it didn't happen, um, that would be really useful. And your email address, Kevin? Um, Kevin.tory at bomb.gov.au. I'm not sure if it's, I can certainly provide it somewhere. No, that, that'll be fine. I'll just go back. Is, is it on your opening slide? I, I don't think I put it on. Okay, there. well, I won't bother. Okay, Kevin.tory at bom.gov.au for anyone who wishes to engage further. And if in doubt, just talk to your local bureau. If they even have Tories address, then just the local bureau people will be able to connect you. But yeah, thanks for that, Tory. Um, I saw the sorry, Kevin. Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> I saw the uh, presentation at the AFAC conference and actually thought, no, this is actually quite useful for early exposure. While sometimes you you want to wait till things get a bit more consolidated, um, you're looking for case studies and. You know, you're not going to do it next week, but certainly over the next 12 months or more, I, this will hopefully bear some fruit in terms of another tool to to help us predict difficult situations. Yeah, we certainly hope to have something um, ready. Um, we, 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 we want to sort of run in-house for this coming season. We hope that we'll be able to um, tune it and come up with a product we're comfortable with by um, the next season. And there's been a little bit of chat. Yeah. Sorry, there's been a little bit of chatter on the the PyroSQ um, discussion group, and occasionally I've run the run the, the analysis on some of those events. But again, I, I can't really provide the answer except I can provide a little bit of insight on what it tells, but I can't present the the results um, quite yet. I'm certainly happy with that, and I think the group are too. We're very happy to help facilitate developing the science. That, that will help us in the longer term. Unless there are any more questions for, Cor uh, for Kevin, yeah. um, that will probably do us for today. Thanks, Mike, and the recording will be available in about a week's time, fingers crossed. Season's greetings, and hopefully you have a, a quiet Christmas, from a fire point of view at least, and we'll be in touch next year with some more webinars. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Kevin.